Welcome to this Heritage Week talk on the Westmead Field Names Recording Project. Angus Finnegan, Dr. Angus Finnegan, who's the project coordinator, um, is going to guide us through the project. And I just want to say a word of thanks to our project funders, the Heritage Council, Westmeath County Council, and also Creative Ireland, who've funded on occasion. So I'll let Angus introduce himself and, and uh, begin the talk. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much, Melanie. Um, so the Westmead Field Names Project, um, we've been on the go since 2018. I'm mainly going to talk about what we've been doing in the last year, but by way of introduction, <clears throat> I'd just like to say a few bits about the project in general. So we've collected over 2,000 names so far. We've had about 120 volunteers involved from 13 different community groups, and I'll mention the areas we've, we've worked on in a minute. Funding is from the Heritage Council, Creative Ireland and Westmead County Council. I'm the project coordinator. I'm a lecturer in Irish at the University of Limerick and I have a background, background in place names. I did a PhD on town and names in County Westmead in NUA Galway in 2012. Um, uh, centrally involved in the project has been the County Heritage Officer, Melanie McQuaid, who supported this project from the beginning. And then we have Michelle Dunn and Justin O'Cleason, two PhD students in Dublin City University, who have been helping us with the uh, preliminary analysis of the names and uploading the material to, uh, to, to the web. So where have we collected names? Uh, Lochna Valley, Topman, Drumraney, Ballymore, Tang, Roger Bridge, Kinnegad, Coon, Collinstown, Four, Multifarnham, Mount Temple and Rosemount. And if you know, uh, the geography of Westmead, that's a good spread all over the county. So these, th th those were all community groups who got involved over the last two or three years. Now, since the pandemic has, has come uh, into our lives, uh, having community meetings has been difficult or impossible at times. So I've been collecting from individuals as well. Um, uh, places like Killinure, Glenwood, Carrick O'Brien, Kilcornan, Port Loman, Collian. So I've gone and talked to farmers or people have approached me individually and uh, requested a, a sheet, a record sheet and map and so on. So what do we do with the names when we publish them? They're uploaded to a website called mehillogannam.ie, which is the national database of minor place names developed by Fionter and Skullmobilia in DCU. And we've also published two booklets, uh, 10 or 12 pages each, outlining some of the preliminary results of the project to date. And they're available online on Westmead County Council's website. They're also on the project web website. The link is there, ingusfinnegan.ie forward slash field names. And hard copies are available from Westmead County Council through uh, the, the heritage of, uh, officer there. So this is what the, this is the way the names are displayed on the website Mehel Loganum. So you just see a little pin for each name. These are some names collected by the Rosemount Group. So we see one example there uh, is Haggart, which is very, very common, usually a little small field near, near the farmhouse um, where the hay was stored for the winter. So in terms of our methodology, as I said, it has changed a little bit. Uh, I'll come to that in a minute um, due to the current circumstances, but Basically, we ask volunteers to identify a townland they want to collect from. We print out a map. We use the Ordnance Survey six inch uh, map from uh, the early 20th century. It's the Cassini print is usually the best, it's the clearest field boundaries from around 1913, 1914. We number the map, so we number each field name. We give them a record sheet and they just have to fill in their name, some details, the date, the townland they're collecting from, the source of the information, which could be the landowner, it could be themselves, or, or so on. Uh, they enter the number in the column on the left of the field, and then the name of the field on the right. And usually then I would meet up with the volunteers, review the material, and ask supplementary questions. For example, if it was an Irish name, I might transcribe the pronunciation directly, or I might make a sound recording. Or sometimes I would even uh, phone up the, the source of the information, if necessary, to get the pronunciation direct from, from the source. Um, we do that also in the case of um, not just Irish names, but any name where there's, there's a question about the form, uh, the linguistic form, so where the pronunciation might be important, local pronunciation of surnames, uh, and anywhere where the actual form of the name is, is unclear. 
So um, this is what a record sheet completed one would look like. And the blue ink there is where I've come back and, and noted the, the pronunciation in, in phonetic transcription. Um, so we try and make sound recordings phonetic, tr phonetic transcriptions of Irish names, surnames and other words with particular local pronunciation or names whose meaning is not obvious. So that's just a very uh, compact form of our methodology. Now, as I said, it has changed a little bit because we're not really doing meetings. So often I will actually meet with individual farmers themselves and I'll take a record of the names um, directly from them uh, myself and go through, go through the map and so on. So moving on to just a little sample of what we've collected recently and also some names which might be were collected over the last year or two but have had time to follow up on them. Um, first one I'm going to look at, <clears throat> most of these names are from around Tang uh, and I'm looking mainly at Irish names today. The last few talks I've given I looked a good bit at English names so I'm going to look specifically at Irish names today. So this one is Lis Mielik. Now the spelling there is as the volunteer recorded, as the, the farmer recorded it. That's how he spelt it. And it's pretty close to how it's pronounced. Uh, I've recorded the pronunciation from him directly. So it's, it's Lis Mielik, as it would be in Irish. And uh, this means ring fort of, of Mielik. Now Mielik is a fairly common word in Irish place names. Uh, you have about 30 examples around the country. The best known would probably be Mielik on the Shannon, in County Galway near Portumna. Um, and Mielik refers to low-lying land bordering a stream. Uh, and uh, Lis then is, is a ring fort or an earthen enclosure of some kind. Now, Lis Mielik doesn't just refer to one field, it refers to all the fields that I'm uh, moving the cursor around there, particularly these ones here, but also these divisions here. They were originally one division, and the Land Commission divided them um, in the 30s or 40s. Now, we do have a river with the Craigie River running south to north towards Loch Ree. It's been canalised since the early 19th century, but you can see the old course of the river, look, see here, runs through the fields themselves. So geographically, it's exactly as we would expect. It is low-lying land bordering a stream. As for the ring fort, we have no sign of a ring fort in the fields themselves, but we have a burial ground here, which be known locally as Temple or Temple of Addy. So still in active use as a graveyard. And it is in a kind of oval enclosure. Uh, it may be an early ecclesiastical site, but it, perhaps there was a ring fort here. Perhaps this is, is the enclosure referred to by, uh, by Lys, which is the first element in the name here. Not entirely sure, but I can see no other sign of a ring fort or any other enclosure on either side of the stream. <coughs> Excuse me. So moving on now, um, to uh, Gardi Futton. Gardi Futton. This is from uh, Dunamoni in Tang. It's actually on the boundary with Drumraney, sort of a, an interface area, we'll call it, between Tang and Drumraney, or other fierce rivals in, in football and all sorts of other things. Um, so this might be uh, Gardi Futton, Gardi Futton, which was pronounced probably locally Gardi Futton. Uh, Patton's garden or Little Pat's garden, uh, Patton being a pet form of, of Pat or Patrick. And the uh, example here that I've found uh, is Aha Patton. And Francis might have something to say about this at the end. Francis Kane from the Northern Ireland Place Names Project. Uh, this is one example um, where you have this pet form of the name uh, of Patrick, Pat, Patton in a place name uh, from County Antrim, Ahafatam. Now it's pronounced Garifutam very clearly, Garifutam. The emphasis is very much on the second syllable. So that leads me to believe that this is a personal name. The first word is fairly clear, Gari, a garden. And uh, I think uh, under the influence of stress shift, which I think was a feature of Irish in this area, <coughs> Patam has changed to Putam. And we see the same thing in another field name from this area, uh, the Kushlan is pronounced the Kushlan locally, the Kushlan. And we have, I think, three examples in field names of the word Kushlan, meaning castle, being pronounced Kushlan. Now, this is a feature of many dialects of Connacht Irish, uh, words of this type, two syllable words where the second syllable is, is a long vowel. 
uh, per shift, uh, the stress has shifted historically from the first to the second syllable and then back onto the first. And you get a pronunciation of a word like bradon, salmon, changing to brodon, or skadon, herring, changing to skodon. And here, paton has become poton, poton. Um, so it's actually quite an interesting name in showing us something of the historical development of Irish in the area. Now, as regards the actual uh, field or fields itself, I'm told by the people who collected it refers to a couple of fields here at a crossroads known as Dunamone Cross. And I think really the name refers specifically to this feature. So you see this little house site and tree lined garden here. Hopefully you can see my cursor on the OS six inch map from 1837. By the time of the Ordnance Survey 25 inch map, 1913, uh, the house is gone. So presumably disappeared during the 19th century, sometime perhaps during the famine. And there's only a small trace of the actual garden enclosure itself. One little bit of the ditch is left. And you can see in the current aerial photograph, uh, just a portion of the ditch survives and there are white thorn trees. I was down there yesterday looking at it. So it's very clear that this was, you know, an old house site. So I think this is uh, Patton's garden. So a man named uh, Patton or short form of Pat had a garden here and a house in the 19th century disappeared during that period, but survives in the form of a name. So quite interesting, I think, in resurrecting this little house site here and um, giving us an insight into the person who actually lived here, which disappeared during the 19th century. And of course, places like this are very vulnerable. Somebody who owns the land there could decide to pull that ditch out about any day and it would just be a green field and we'd never know anything of what was there. So linguistically as well as historically interesting. Um, okay. Uh, Barry Fatten also encountered your own, I see from Francis there. Okay, I'll have to look that up. Very interesting. So moving on, if I can get this to move on. Uh, okay. Now, next one is Lachan Aona. So I think this is Lachan Aona. So Lachan Aona, pronounced locally Lachan Aona, Lachan Aona, with the emphasis on the second syllable. And Lochan is a small lake or a pond, very, very common in field names all over Westmead, sometimes pronounced curiously enough as Lohan, Lohan. Uh, Lochan and Lahan is probably the most common pronunciation all over Westmead, Lahan. But I have heard Lohan, we record that from around Ballymore, and uh, Lochan as well. Now, the second part of it here is the word Awan for river, <coughs> excuse me. And we have an alternative gender form, Alma, but it's pronounced here as it would be in Ulster Irish, which is a little bit unusual, a little bit surprising. Uh, if I'm correct in my analysis here, and it's Lochan Oda. Lochan Oda. Now, looking at the actual setting, I think it's pretty clear the dominant feature in this field is a small stream, which spreads out into you know, a large pond. <clears throat> when, when there's times of heavy rainfall. So you look at the field here on the right, the spring, there's a spring there in the north of the field and a stream flows through the field down to the south and it actually eventually joins into a small river. And <clears throat> it has been drained, but I'd say historically that this would have been, you know, uh, flooded quite a lot of the time. So the pronunciation is probably the most curious thing here. I think the form of the name is fairly clear. I think it is definitely Lochan Aona or Lahanona, Lochan Aona, as, as it's pronounced. Um, but the uh, actual pronunciation is unusual. There is an example in Leitrim, uh, Dernahona. Now, uh, you know, Leitrim is much further north, so that wouldn't surprise me as much, but I'm surprised to get that pronunciation of Aona in County Westmead. Anyway, we can come back to that at the end if people have questions or suggestions. Now, actually, uh, that one I just collected yesterday, but I had collected it from another person in the area. And it's always great when we can collect names independently from two different sources. So we have it from the landowner and also from a neighbouring farmer independently of each other. And they had the same pronunciation, which is great for verifying, you know, the, that we have a real traditional form of the name. Now, moving on to another name, actually, which I just collected yesterday which is Caron from the townland of Kilcornan, same townland as the previous one. Um, and 
This is divided into two, or it's known as high karan and low karan. And there's low land and high land. The hill is known as high karan, and the lower part is known as low karan. Now, the form here is fairly clear. It's, it's the word uh, kard, which has a lot of meanings in place names and the diminutive uh, suffix on, so little kard. Now, what does kard mean in this case? So if we look at the Ordnance Survey map, I think the name comes from this feature here, this artwork here, which is identified as a ring fort on the archaeology.ie database. And Cardon in general refers to a whole division of the townland of Kilcarlan, about over 100 acres, about 110 acres. So the farm has a number of divisions, uh, and this is all known as Cardon. This part on the left is known as High Cardon, and this lower part as Low Cardon. Now, I think it comes from this artwork. And as I said, curd can mean a number of things, but uh, you know, a projecting point or a prominence of some kind would be one of the more common means, meanings in place names. For example, from the uh, folklore of Belgi Bairle, the diction we have, uh, the horn of the anvil, if you can think of, of the, the pointy part of the anvil, or a you know, the pommel of a saddle, think of a feature like that. And if you look at the picture here, which is not great, I took it leaning over the ditch yesterday very, very quickly. Uh, you have the ring fort here and it's on a sort of a, a small escarpment and the hill is actually more prominent than you would think from that photograph. It's, it's a reasonably big hill and the ring fort itself is, is on a raised area. And I think that's the, that's the cardan itself. Uh, now, cord can also refer to a rounded hill, but in this case, I think it refers to a projecting point. If you see it in real life, it's quite a prominent feature. Um, so again, that's telling us a little bit more about that ring fort and um, bringing it beyond me, merely you know, the, the uh, physical manifestation that you could see in the landscape, but how people actually appreciated a feature of that type, what vocabulary they had to refer to something like that in the past. Um, and a very interesting name, which has now become the name of a whole division of that townland. Okay, now one more uh, and this one was collected about a year and a half ago, but I only had time to go back and look at it fairly recently. And this is uh, two fields, this one and this one, these two here in the centre foreground with the darker vegetation, uh, they're low, moory ground. And they're known as steg bottoms, steg bottoms. Now, steg is the same word as, uh, you know, a steak in English, like a strip of meat. It can refer to a strip of land, and Steg Halun is a patch of bleak, barren land. And this is quite a moory, open, uh, bleak area just on, on the banks of, of the Dundagalman or, or Tang River. Now, interestingly, uh, as well as uh, being recorded by you know, the volunteers in Tang as part of the project orally, from the oral tradition, this name also uh, is recorded in the written tradition. So if we look at the down survey map from uh, 1655, we have in the same location, we have this place, Steg uh, Rioch or something like that, an anglicized spelling, which I think is an anglicization of Steg Rivoch, Steg Rivoch. Now Rivoch, you have a Rivoch cow, the famous brindle cow that uh, uh, occurs in well there's the tradition about the borrowed days in, in late March and early April. We won't go into that now. But Revoc is a very common word in place names, normally referring to a uh, streaked or striped or mottled vegetation, maybe where you'd have um different types of grass like moor grass and uh, uh sage and so on, which you would have in this area. So uh, here you have the the Steg Revoc, so the the mottled or the I have a misspelling there, it should be drab rather than drab, drab, the streaked or the mottled or the, the striped um, steak, which refers to a strip of land. So actually the two words here kind of refer to the same uh, feature in the landscape, which is the nature of the vegetation here. So very interesting when you record a name in the oral tradition, which you also have uh, in the documentary tradition. Now, I'd often come across that in different written sources, but I didn't have an exact location. So now, because of the work of the project, I have an exact location here beside the river. I knew it was in this general area. Uh, it really surprised me that the name had survived because there are lots of names on the down survey maps which haven't survived, or at least I didn't think they had survived until I did detailed fieldwork. So I think, again, that's an example of, of the real value of this kind of project, getting out into the community and collecting from individual landowners 
uh, and and in, in getting into uh, you know the really local uh, knowledge. Um, so a few other names, some of which I need to do a bit of work on from Tang, uh, the Kushlan we mentioned already, uh, the 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 Kashri, the Kashri. I think this is a form of Kashir, which is a uh, land which was was thrown back or left fallow. Um, after tillage, it's very, very common in field limbs, but I'm not 100% certain. Uh, Gertie, little field, uh, Bogon, and it's it's soft ground, Bogon, soft ground, and the field has, has peat soil in it. Uh, Kulin, a little corner. Uh, Monin, a little moor, a little bog. Uh, the Toher, on Toher, the, the causeway. Uh, Shantala. Now, this one is very interesting. Um, the final syllable here is a, an open central vowel, as you would get in, in Connacht Irish, so on Shantala, and uh, the, literally the old land, so perhaps, you know, land that was, was used for tillage but had been let out fallow or something like that again. And again, this name occurs once in the documentary tradition as Shantala or Shantalo uh, in Inquisition of 1633. So just mentioned once in the 17th century and then it's known by the landowner. So very, very interesting, uh, you know, to be able to verify the location of a name like that. We knew approximately, or I knew approximately, the way it was mentioned in the document where it was, but not exactly. Now I know exactly uh, the fields that uh, comprise uh, Chantala. Uh, Lissahon, probably a diminutive form of Lis, a ring fort. And uh, there are a few more as well. Now, uh, moving on to uh, a different part of the county, and I hope you can read the names on that map, it's probably quite small on the screen. This is a fabulous uh, map of Raynal, or the townland of Ballynagall, um, from uh, 1761, and it has a huge amount of field names on it. I haven't counted them in total, but there's uh, 25 or maybe 30 field names in total. And most of them are English names. So we have the Aha Garden, which is uh, this piece of land here on the south side of, of the castle. So it was probably a vista from the castle itself. Now, an Aha is sort of a dry ditch. Um, it's, it was used as a field boundary where uh, they wanted to keep the view open. So it's a sunken ditch with a wall or a retment on one side, which would prevent animals having gone down into the ditch from getting out of it and crossing into the next field. But uh, as it's sunken down under the surface of the ground, it doesn't obscure your view like a, a raised ditch, you know, a normal ditch, a hedge on a, on a raised bank. Uh, New Wall Garden, Hay Yard, it's, you know, probably uh, Haggart as well. It's unusual to see Hay Yard written. Uh, Avenue Lawn, Miller's Holdings, so Miller being the surname, Bullock Park. Most of those are fairly clear. Um, Wheatfield, Potato Park, Ram Park, and so on. So most of those are, are fairly straightforward. There are a few Irish names on it as well, and they're very interesting. So we, and the spelling here is as it is on the map. So we've uh, Knock and Ban is from uh, Knock on Bon, the White Hillock. Uh, Knock of Ole. Now this one is, this little tiny area here, it has a circular wooded feature in it. It's W on the map. It's only about two acres. And uh, this might be a crook on Moolet. Crook and Bula, the hill of the Bully, Bully being uh, an enclosure where cows are put in to be milked. Um, Clonaboy, Clonach Bui, now Clonach is place of pastures, you know, a meadowy place, and Bui, perhaps there was buttercups, buttercups growing there uh, or something like that, so Clonach Bui, uh, fairly, fairly commonplace field name. Uh, Loch and Lee, Loch on Lee, now we can actually, can I see that here? Yeah, you can't actually see the pond, but it is marked and it's still clearly visible on the aerial photograph today. Although it's dried up, you can still see the outline. Of it. So lock on a pond and Leah Gray, perhaps the surface of the water. This one is really interesting. Uh, fear in the Grainne. So fear in the Grainne uh, in Irish. So fear is, is lee land. So again, uncultivated grassland, lay or lee land. Uh, I think lay is the, the proper pronunciation. Uh, quite common in townland names in Westmead, there are a number of, of fear moors, pronounced furthermore, usually. Uh, and this one uh, is uh, very gently, very gently sloping to the south. 
it's a small field sloping very gently to the south. So again, may refer to the aspect of the field. Shear the Kalenia, so the uh, lay of the sunshine. Little knock and row and big knock and row and crock on hua. So the red hillock, perhaps there was bracken or ferns growing on the, the, the hillocks here. And then the last one is perhaps the least certain uh, in terms of the original form. So it's uh, Arti Kavana. Now, the initial part is definitely Ard. And I've looked at the map and there's very clear ridge running through this. It's an area of about 45 Irish acres, so 70 something statute acres. Uh, there's a very clear raised ridge running through it. Uh, line of spot heights kind of 260 to 300 feet. So it's definitely height or uh, it may be a surname, but uh, grammatically I can't make any surname fit there, you know, Kavana, Quivanoch, but you don't get uh, the O prefix with, with Quivanoch. So we have, it can't be or the Quivana, that wouldn't work grammatically. So I think it's perhaps something else. It could be or on Gardavana, or on Gardavana. And Gardavanoch being a common enough word in place names referring to rough land from the card of the adjective meaning rough. So Gardavanoch, a rough place, rough land. And the land is a little bit more rugged perhaps than the land around it. So perhaps height of the rough land. Although I wouldn't rule out a surname, but uh, I can't make any, uh, I can't think of any surname that would fit there grammatically. The few names there that may be translations from Irish names, so Little Cartran and Big Cartran, 15 Irish acres and 25 acres respectively. Now a Cartran is a quarter land, it's a word that came into, uh, came into Irish and English from Anglo-Norman French and uh, probably refers to a quarter of a ploughland, ploughland being 100 to 120 acres traditionally, so they're not too far off, Little Cartran being kind of a small quarter. It fits reasonably well, and I wouldn't be surprised if there are translations from Irish names, something like on Cartoon Moor and on Cartoon Bug. And then we have two other interesting ones. We have New Town and Old Town, and could be translations of on Bananua and on Chanwala. There may be English names. And if you look at the map here, where I have the cursor. There's a line of houses here running across. This is New Town. There's an area of bog. This is part of Scraw Bog. And then we have Old Town here, and there are no buildings at all shown in Old Town. So perhaps this is where the settlement was. Uh, you see a circular enclosure there. Maybe there was something there. And then you have this line of houses here in New Town. Now, when you look at the Ordnance Survey First Edition map, there are no buildings shown here whatsoever. So they had been completely removed. This entire settlement had disappeared, which was new in 1761. So it probably had been built within a couple of generations. It was completely gone by 1837. I su suspect that the settlement was here because of the bog, uh, that they were, they were cutting turf there, and that's why it was a suitable place for, for the cottages here. So there's quite a lot you can tell. One other thing I'd say about the map that's very interesting, the green lines here, there, these are hedges. These are what I would call ditches, so probably um, you know, white thorn uh, hedges on raised banks. And almost every field is surrounded by uh, a ditch of that type except the lower ground where there's just a line shown and I'd say there are drains or, or water courses. So clearly this entire townland was enclosed. All these, in some cases, quite small fields were enclosed by ditches. If you look on the Ordnance Survey, first edition, it had changed radically, the whole layout of the townland. Uh, the castle had been demolished and a new house uh, had been built there in the early 19th century and the whole layout of the fields had changed. If you look at an aerial photograph from today, you'll see that there's been huge changes again. This whole area here with all these small fields is now one large division. Um, so you can really unearth a huge amount about the landscape by looking at field names recorded from the oral tradition, but of huge value then is actually comparing these to uh, these kind of old maps which have field names on them, which aren't that common. We have lots of old estate maps, but often they just show the name of the tenants. They don't always show uh, the the uh, field names, okay? So, yeah, suggestion there from Francis could be RT surname. That's a very good uh, uh, idea there. That's a possibility. Uh, it could be something like RT Quivana or something like that, okay? Okay, um, so if I move on then to the final side, it's just questions. 
And if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to ask. Angus, thank you so much for your talk. Um, really interesting, some really interesting names there. And I think fascinating to see that you've an example from the Down survey that is still extant in a field name today. So some really valuable information, I think, coming in and the reference from the maps, the old uh, hedgerows uh, and how the landscape has changed. I'm going to pause recording now if people have questions. Um, I certainly have some, but I'm not going to monopolise. So I'll let somebody else come in. <laughs>